Hey, good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. Welcome to the Church Town Church of God. We are vertical again. For whatever reason, Facebook has decided it no longer does those horizontal shots. Here we are, where we had a wonderful morning of worship for those who could make it on Sunday morning. You know, it's always a always a bit of a struggle here at a small church. You get a couple of families out and you're like, where is everybody? But it was good. It was good. No complaints whatsoever. It was a fantastic day of music, fantastic music, fantastic worship, fantastic prayer. Our prayer time is just outstanding and uh, we just enjoy ourselves very much. Caring for one another in that manner is very important. Well, it's very important to most, shall we say. Anywho, here we are, and I have to turn my tripod one more time because, like I said, Facebook is not doing the horizontal. Let me get this straight. Not doing the horizontal picture. So let me get that there. Fans are rolling. It's that time of year now. We're supposed to have three 80 degree days. I don't even know what that's all about. That's a little crooked. Let me just straighten you up here. Uh, I thought I could. There we go. That's better, right? How's that? Is that okay? Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Liz. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, everybody. I'll get you here in a moment as I prepare my lovely face so I don't scare you all to death. Here we go. We are back and better than ever in this first week of October. It's my birthday week. Woo, woo, woo. Friday. Friday's probably the busiest day of my week. I'll be working all day long and into the night. Friday night here at Churchtown in the sanctuary is the movie October Baby. Which you would say, hey, October Baby and it's your birthday, but it's about abortion. Now, it's a significant movie. I don't mean to be glib. But it's here at 7 o'clock in the sanctuary, and it is a powerful piece of cinema. So you should come and see that if you choose to be, be educated about the topic. Father, we pray that you will educate us this morning as we go into your word. In the name of Jesus the Christ of God, we pray for your wisdom, your purposes this morning. We pray that your power moves out and guides and leads every child of God. And for those who are not yet the children of God, Lord, we pray that your truth prevails in their lives and there is repentance and submission to the one true living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm glad that everybody's here this morning. We're going to talk about what? Jesus. We are currently on week 30-something of our 52-week series on Jesus here at Churchtown. But we're talking about God in this, his triune nature is where we've been focused. We have been talking about God and his triune nature, and not just where the Trinity appears in Scripture. Because, of course, the Trinity is not mentioned in Scripture. Okay, you're right. But it is a given to the writers of Scripture. God, as all Scripture is God-breathed, allows us to see himself as he is. God the Father, God the Word, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We have been examining God's Holy Spirit now in the Old Testament for a couple of weeks and examining who He is. Rejoice in the beautiful morning. Amen. I'll tell you what, and you guys can take a vote. Because I don't even, I don't, maybe I don't even want to say this out loud, but I don't believe in luck. I believe in God's Holy Spirit. But I might have a couple of hours off today. I might have a couple of hours on this 80 degree day to do something 
And I'm not mowing today. Got my mower back. I'm waiting for Thursday. Start to finish is Big Mow Thursday. I can't wait. I'm getting psyched. But what should I do today? Hmm? Should I head out to the range? Should I do a little shooting? Should I jump on the soft tail and do a little riding? What would be your vote? I can't do both. Well, unless I rode my bike to the range, but that's not much of a ride. Would you go riding or would you go shooting? So I'm, I'm like, hey, I, I might have some time off, which is pretty cool. So anyway, that's my life. That's where I am. Those are the big decisions in, in my life right now. What should I do today? But we'll wait and see. So that's what we're talking about here at Churchtown. And we have been opening the scriptures and we have been looking at who God is. And we begin with the understanding of the triune nature of God. God the Father, God the Logos, who becomes the Son, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we're looking at God's Holy Spirit is where we're going with that. And we examine from the very beginning of Genesis and we examine all of the different capacities in which God's Holy Spirit works. See, <laughs> ride to the range and shoot. Keep voting. Keep voting. I'll take it. Um, and I'll take it deeply into consideration. And so I get over there and I get my work done, man. Woo! I get over there and get my work done. I'll be like, whoa, what am I going to do? It's 80 degrees. So anyway, I'm excited. You should be excited too, like Lindsay. It's an amazing day. Every day is an amazing day. How can you say that? Don't you see the news? Oh, poo on the news. You know who you are. You know who he is. You know who you are in him. So poo on the news. You know that light has come into the world and you know that the darkness will not overcome it. So be like Lindsay, rejoice, but, 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 but there's so, rejoice, I say again, rejoice, for you are a child of God, and there is no circumstance on this earth, whether it is directly affecting you or not directly affecting you, whether it becomes actual Christian persecution like occurs in at least one third of the world today, or whether it is just dopey people arguing about there is no trinity mentioned in the Bible. Rejoice, for you know who he is, and you know who you are, and you know that light has come into the world. You know that men will reject the light because they love their darkness, but you know that the darkness will never, ever, ever overcome the light, the light that shines in you. There's your, there's your Christian pep talk for the day. So live. It's the old saying. What do we say around? Live like you're not afraid of dying. Because we shouldn't. To live is to be with Christ. To live is to live with the power of Christ within us. To die is to be with Christ. What's the problem here, folks? I'm, I'm very squirrely today. I begin on a topic and then, but you, but you, but you, but you, you. Let me read this. The day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice. There's a song. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, I don't know the tune. If you had musical inclinations or if there were audio, somebody could sing me that song. Hi, Stacy. So this Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Now, there is a little bit of debate as to whether or not Nicodemus is trying to be sly here or not. Well, we know, right? He comes to him at night, which is an indicator that perhaps it is only him. 
right? Could be only him, of the whole council, that actually is beginning to believe that Jesus is of God or God, one or the other. He could be coming to him at night because the Pharisees in general don't want to see any of their representatives going to him because the Pharisees in general are believing that he is of God or God. It could be that he is coming deceitfully as a part of the Pharisaic council and saying, oh, you know that we believe. Mm, haven't really shown that up to this point, but okay. Jesus doesn't care. One, he knows the answer to the question. And two, he doesn't give, him, he doesn't give the question any credence whatsoever. He doesn't give the question any power over him whatsoever. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Does that answer, I mean, does that even reply to Nicodemus' introduction to Jesus? Jesus knows the answer. And it doesn't matter. Because this is ordained of God that he is going to teach to him and thus to us through the Apostle John's account about being born again in the spirit, being renewed, being restored, being covered by the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Christ. I love this. And if I could only have the discipline to do this when people say inane things to me or people try to get into those inane dis arguments, when people jump, we talked about this before, we talked about it last week, we talked about, you right, as a Christian, you present yourself as a Christian and say, oh, so therefore you hate homosexuals. Jump, jump the shark right over to a talking point that they heard on some news program or something that they saw on TikTok, right? Boom. And that's what we said last week. Well, I know what you may have what your understanding may be, and I understand where you may have received that understanding. If you would like to have a conversation about this, we'll open the scriptures and we'll talk about this. If not, I'm not going to engage in a superficial, inane argument with you. Jesus does much the same thing here. Nicodemus comes in saying, whether he is 100% contrite and true and being honest or whether he is 100% not trying to, as they often do, catch Jesus in some sort of a trap, he cuts right through it. One, when an individual comes to me like that, I don't know their heart. Two, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he does know him. Uh, Jesus does know Nicodemus' heart. So there's that. But I just love the way, let me read this again. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, very crucial, and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now that could be opening up, that could be jumping the shark, as we say. Give a thumbs up if you remember that, if you know what that reference is, jumping the shark. I watched that episode. I know what it means. But that could be jumping the shark for, for Nicodemus, right? We know that you are of God, wanting him to say, yes, I am God, I am the Messiah, I am whatever. And then boom, blasphemy, hang him. But Jesus answers it in one of the most unique ways. And he does this throughout, especially the Gospel of John, but throughout all of the Gospels. Jesus just says, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus jumps right in. How can someone be born when they are old? Born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. This is an educated man. He's, and you're going to see Jesus take him from a very concrete level of understanding, being born, being physically born of a woman, 
and you're going to see him take into a open spiritual understanding of what it means to be born again, what it means to believe, what it means to have God's Holy Spirit within you. So there's the first level. You, that, can't, that can't happen. How is a man to be born again? He cannot enter the womb a second time. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now this takes on significant because he uses significance because he uses the term and he, he, he compares God's spirit to wind, which is one of the primary definitions of Ruach, the spirit of God, the wind, the life breath, breath, wind, spirit, and mind. Things that you cannot see but you can experience. It's a very, very useful word that God has chosen. Wow, you're pretty good. To describe the full expanse and to get us to open our understanding of God's spirit. The wind blows where it will, and you do not know because you cannot see it. So it is with God's spirit, according to God's will, and when you encounter the wind, you encounter that physical force. It will be blowing against you. It will blow a leaf into your face, whatever the case may be. When you encounter God's spirit, you will be born again of that spirit. There will be a spiritual force. I was going to say coming against you, but there's got to be a better term. Entering into you. There's a spiritual force that you will experience. How about that? And when you look at the language that he's using, he's using language that is going to make a Pharisee's ears perk up. You're ruach? What do you mean? God's spirit, right? Wind is physical. God's spirit is spiritual. We will encounter both. We will experience both. One externally, one internally. So we sort of look at that and we say, okay, but if you're a Pharisee asking these questions and you're speaking in the languages in language in which Jesus spoke, you're like, was he comparing spirit to the wind, the physical to the spiritual? Being born again with this spirit of God? Whoa! <clears throat> How can this be? Nicodemus asked. So he's given up trying to draw comparisons. He just says, How can this be? And Jesus goes back at him. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, the wind, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things, the spirit? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone, and everyone in, that, in the language means everyone. We were talking last Sunday about moving from under the old covenant to the new, and we read prophecy in which the prophet speaks of the renewal of Jerusalem, and you can read Joel too, it's, it begins to apply to the people of Jerusalem, there will come a day when all people, so moves from the people of God and the prophecy moves to all people. Now here is Jesus, here is the fulfillment of that prophecy, and he is speaking, good morning Miss April, and he is speaking in that language, everyone. The new covenant is about to be sealed. 
and everyone who will believe in the name of Jesus Christ in the completed work on the cross, everyone who will repent and believe who will believe and profess. How many different ways do I have to say it? Everyone will be saved. So we're moving out from under the old covenant. The Pharisees have a very difficult time with this, obviously, because they are the, God is the keeper of the old covenant, but they view themselves as the earthly keeper of the old covenant, if you will. Those who hold all of the religious power over lording the people. They're going to have a particularly difficult time understanding and moving from under the old covenant to the new. You do not believe these things. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. He's standing right in front of him. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's a reference to his crucifixion that everyone who believes not everyone who sees that event not everyone who sees the resurrection the new covenant as the old was here's where the more things change the more they stay the same is based on faith in our holy sovereign god that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him but only in him you don't be, you're, you're not granted the gift of eternal life and then go off on your own and do, you are in Christ, he is in you, John 17. The kingdom of God is at hand all over the gospels. And the kingdom of God is now and the kingdom of God is yet to be fulfilled in its fruition. It is now and yet to come. The kingdom of God, the renewal begins with the resurrection of Jesus, the firstborn of many. Woo! For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's very famous, but did you ever notice he's speaking prophetically? He's still alive in his first natural state, if you will. He is prophesying of what will transpire in the days to come. He is prophesying about the significance of what will transpire in the days to come. And he is providing us with the theology necessary to move from under the old covenant to under the new covenant. For he will be the final blood sacrifice, if you will. There will be no more of that. For the only individual, the only human being with a perfect moral nature, the only human being to ever walk the face of the earth who did not deserve to die will willingly give himself to die for the sake of everyone, as it says in the previous verse. Powerful stuff, powerful understanding. Words that we read through very quickly, but when you just slow down just a little bit and unpack them, you're like, whoa. There's a lot happening here all at once. There's past tense, present tense, future tense, future perfect tense. All of these things are given to us for our understanding. So we quote that, <coughs> John 3, 16, all the time. But it's so unique in the way Jesus is prophesying about the now and the yet to come and prophesying about the why, not to condemn the world, right? <clears throat> but to save the world through him. That is the desire of God. The world, in the previous verses, everyone, things are changing. 
We're moving from the old to the new. Things are changing to save the world through him. Now, people like to stop there. See, there is no condem condemnation, right? There is no condemnation of sin. Jesus loves everyone. Love is love, man. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Stop there. Stop there. I can't stop there because that's not where scripture stops. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So you see that as the fulfillment of the law, he is present. When, when Hebrews stood before the law, one of the purposes of the law, if not the primary purpose of the law, was to demonstrate how far away from God they were and how in need of an intermediary they were to draw closer to a holy God. And in order to do this, they needed to ritualistically follow through with all of these different things, these different behaviors, and the priest would be the intermediary for them. Enter into the holy of holies and ask for forgiveness for the people. Well, Jesus, as the fulfillment of, law, of the law, the complete fulfillment of the law, is standing there before people. Spiritually, he is standing before us now. And we either look upon him and believe, or we look upon him and reject. But we must do one or the other. You say, well, I reject all of, well, then you reject Jesus. I will not decide. I am my own person. I am an island of moral integrity unto myself. You have made your decision. You've rejected Jesus. I openly reject Jesus and am antagonistic to the Christian faith. Oh, so be it. I am another religion that is openly antagonistic to the Christian faith. So be it. It's all wrapped up there in John chapter 3. For the fulfillment of the law, the word, law, is written in, excuse me, words, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and presented to us in physical form the fulfillment of the law, what it would look like if a human being could be, as a free moral agent, completely adhere to God's law. That's Jesus. And those who believe in the Christ of God, the Savior, the Messiah, are not condemned. But those who see this know the truth because we worship in spirit and truth and reject are condemned. So no, Jesus doesn't walk around going, I judge you to be okay. I judge you to be condemned. I judge you. No. He is the standard upon which we as free moral agents, I want to say judge ourselves, <laughs> but that, I don't know how to put it into words. He is the standard that we as free moral agents are given the choice to believe or not. Because this is the verdict. If there is no judgment, then why is there a verdict? The verdict is the ultimate outcome of judgment. Jesus is the standard. We see. And this is what happens. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth 
comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that they, what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Can you set your... Thank you, April. Well said. Can you set your self aside? Open yourself and make yourself vulnerable. Walk into the light and say, I repent. I am a sinner. I repent. And all of those sins come to light. And if you are able to give yourselves over in the name of Jesus Christ to our holy sovereign God, if you are able to repent and bow down before him and give yourself, can you break those prideful strongholds and do that? You are granted a renewal of your life of your spirit as yours you are invaded by the very light of God it's powerful stuff it's a powerful powerful passage and it is some of the primary and basic foundations theological foundations of our Christian faith do you believe and I believe that to go back and bring it full circle, Nicodemus opens with how he opens. Oh, we believe that you are of God because nobody can perform signs and wonders like that if they're not of God. And Jesus says, boom, let's find out. Goes right to the heart of Nicodemus. Because believing because you've seen signs and wonders is one thing. But understanding what has truly happened here, the word has become flesh. that the perfect moral human being is walking the face of the earth, that the fulfillment of the law has come to pass, and that those who will believe spiritually in that are saved, not because you saw signs and wonders. Those are, if you will, attention getters and confirmers of the power of God, drawing people unto him and confirming and they are done at that time for our sake in this time. We read and we believe. Father, we do pray that we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Grant us by the power of your Holy Spirit the faith to continue to grow and become the people of God that you see in such an anti-Christian world. Lord, we need you. We give ourselves to you. We are not. We are not islands unto ourselves. We are creations of the Most High God and we seek, Lord, to grow as children of the Most High God, adopted into your family through our repentance, our turning, our belief. We pray the kingdom of God grows today as the truth of this word moves out through this media and changes hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. If you didn't vote, you need to vote. I want to see your vote. Should I go? I got, I got, keep looking around. But that's all superstitious, right? It's not Christian. But I think I'm going to have a few hours this afternoon to myself. Should I go shooting or should I go riding? What say you? Good Lord willing and the river don't rise. I, we will be back together again on Friday morning. Guess what we're talking about? Jesus in the advent of God's Holy Spirit. May God bless you and keep you until then. And everybody live by Lindsay's declaration. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
Rejoice and be glad in it. It's a beautiful day. Who said that? Lindsay said that, and then Dee said that. We should all live like that. God is greater than your circumstance. You are saved. You are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. By the power of God, you have overcome death and the fear of death. You have overcome sin and the power of sin. Live like it. Don't be afraid. 